Hello and welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm here with Dr. Paul Offit, author of Deadly Choices, How the Anti-Vaccination Movement threatened us, Threatens Us All, It Threatens Us All, right, mm -hmm. or Puts Us All in Danger. He's the author of seven books, actually, and I think four or five of them are specifically on vaccinations and it's, vaccines. That's right, a few of them, huh? Um, and so I'm really excited that you're here to talk to me because there have been some small instances related and there have been some large instances related. But first I want to ask you, why did you first start writing about this? Did something happen in your own practice? Did you foresee a calamitous event coming? Why start writing about vaccinations? Well, my uh, research interest is in vaccines. So I worked with a group at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that spent 26 years creating the strains that, and, and doing the research that ultimately became the rotavirus vaccine road attack. Um, it was a 26 year effort. It taught me how difficult it was to do that. And in the midst of all that, in 1998, Andrew Wakefield published a paper claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism. So on the one hand, I saw how hard it was to make a vaccine to prove that it was exactly what you claimed it to be and how easy it was to damn them. And it just upset me. So I guess I got in the game. And it seems easier to damn it than to make sure it's safe and efficacious. Is that sure. The word? I mean, the, the phase three study that we did was a prospective placebo controlled 11 countries, 72,000 person, $350 million trial to prove that this vaccine was exactly what it was claimed to be. And prior to that, you had to do dose ranging studies and, and uh, real time uh, stability studies and make sure the buffering agent was right and the stabilizing agent was right and the vial was right. It was really hard to get that through the FDA. And, and when we did it, it was probably a $1.2 billion effort. Um, we now have a vaccine which is used in the United States and has reduced the incidence of suffering and hospitalization and death by about 90 percent, and it's in the world. So it was a massive effort, and I, that, that, compared with how easy it was to claim the vaccines were hurting people, was really hard to watch. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Andrew Wakefield did a study that had involved six people. He had a competing vaccine he was trying to promote. Um, there were some other sketchy details, is that correct? It wasn't a study at all, it was a case, a case series, which is to say he had 12 children, eight of whom had children. autism, um, all the eight of whom had developed autism within a month of receiving the vaccine, but that's because the vaccine doesn't prevent autism. When a study was done, and there have been 17 studies looking at children who did or didn't receive the MMR vaccine, obviously the rate of autism was the same in both groups. And since then, of course, the study's been discredited. He, I don't know if he's been, it's not disbarred. I don't know if he lost his license or not, but it was never. He a, lost his license. He lost his license. It was not a real study. It he, wasn't a study. He wasn't a study. Anything. Well, how did it make its way into a journal? I think the real answer to that question is that the editor-in-chief of the journal, Richard Horton, was a friend of Andrew Wakefield's. They'd been uh, colleagues together in medical school. And so he thought, what the hell? Let's just throw it out there. And if it's true, it's true. And if it's false, it's false. We'll just see. Um, I'm stunned because... You'd think that at a professional journal, there'd be a higher level of professionalism, right? Um, rather than this guy's a friend of mine, so let's publish his study. That is shocking. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, and it is an excellent journal. It's probably the oldest of the general medical journals. Four of the six people that reviewed that paper all argued to reject it. Normally, that would have meant the paper was rejected, but Richard Horton sort of reached down, used his editorship to sort of pull it up out of the abyss and published it. Is there any way to quantify the damage that paper did? Yes, there is. I mean, in, in, in the United Kingdom and in, in, uh, in, uh, in Scotland and Ireland, there were about, uh, about uh, thousands of people who chose not to vaccinate their children. There were hundreds who were hospitalized, and there were four who died, four who died. So therefore, you can argue four people died because of that paper. In the United States, uh, parents of about 125,000 children no, chose not to vaccinate. So two years ago, we had about 680 cases of measles. Last year, we had about 190 cases of measles, all of which started last year from this sort of Southern California Disneyland uh, epidemic because people were scared that vaccines might cause autism. And so they avoided measles-containing vaccine, and so measles is back. Measles, a disease which we eliminated in this country in 2000, is back because of the paper, I think in large part, that Andrew Wakefield published in 1998, which has now been retracted and he's lost his license. But, you know, as they say, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after. And not only that, but retraction, some people will say that smacks of conspiracy right there. It was retracted, but not really. He was correct. And this is all just a conspiracy for some dumb reason. There will always be those people. And so... As a medical doctor, you are liable for malpractice. Is a journal ever liable for the damage it does? 
I mean, is it, it's quantifiable, you're saying, but are there any repercussions? Well, I think they hide behind that sort of absence of malice. They did the best they could. It turned out it, it turns wasn't. Out, but was it the best they could? It no, I think it, I think it wasn't. It was totally a well, it was worse than that. I mean, what ended up happening was that he had received money from the Legal Services Commission essentially to launder legal claims through a medical journal. Five of the eight patients in that study were in the midst of suing a pharmaceutical company. He neglected to mention that to either the, the uh, journal or to his co-authors. Similarly, he misrepresented biological data. He misrepresented clinical data. There were some children, for example, who he said had received the vaccine, then developed autism, where in fact their signs and symptoms of autism preceded that vaccine, but he switched that in his paper. I mean, it was, it was fraud, it was and that's why it was retracted. Fraud. There's a lot of crappy papers that are published uh, every day. There's 4,000 papers that are published every day in the world's medical literature. Some are great, some are awful, most are more or less mediocre. You really have to screw up to get your paper retracted, and he screwed up because he falsified data. So I have sympathy for people who... I guess you ha if your child becomes really ill a short term later, you have to find some reason for it. Um, so how do you, I guess, what do you say when you see those kind of... I think it's a reasonable question to ask. My child was fine. They got a vaccine. Now they're not fine. Could the vaccine have done that? That's an answerable question. That can be answered in a scientific venue. So my child was fine, as Jenny McCarthy says. Then he got the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and now he has autism. Could the vaccine have done it? It's an answerable question. I mean, you're not trying to answer how many angels can dance on the head of a pin here. You're trying to answer, is your risk greater of getting autism if you've received an MMR vaccine or not? And so you can look at, as has been done now, millions of children who either did or didn't get that vaccine on several different continents with many different investigators to see whether the risk is greater. I mean, does cigarette smoking cause lung cancer? Yes, and there's a dose response curve. The more you smoke, the more likely you are to get lung cancer. So epidemiological studies are quite powerful, and every time they've been done, they haven't found it. You can't claim on the one hand that vaccines cause autism and claim that, va that autism is as common as one in 66 children and then not be able to find it on these retrospective studies. Take me back just a little bit. Let's step back. And uh, I read your book, and it was quite interesting because the history of that anti-vaccination movement, it seems like the movement's new to me, but according to you, vaccines... As old as they are, there have been controversies. Sure. The first vaccine was the smallpox vaccine. It was developed by Edward Jenner in 1796. By 1804, there was a, a cartoon by uh, James Gilray, which showed a disinterested Edward Jenner standing amongst a group of people who were starting to take on bovine characteristics, you know, floppy ears and snouts and tails, because the smallpox vaccine was cowpox. And people thought they were going to be get, become cows if they got a cowpox vaccine. I mean, we look back at that now as laughable, but frankly, the biological plausibility that a measles-containing vaccine would cause autism is about as, as plausible as cowpox causing you to become a cow. Do you feel it do you feel frustrated at all that you're a doctor and people have their primary care physicians, but they, they'll hear Jenny McCarthy on the Oprah show or whatever it was, and then they'll come back to you and said, I just heard this on TV. What do you think? That why does a celebrity get a more respected voice, I guess I should say. Because we trust celebrities, because we why? see them on the bigger little screen and we think we know them. I mean, that's why they sell products. I mean, they're selling a variety of products because that sells, because people trust them, because they know them, because they're attractive, because they're well-spoken, and so people trust them. I understand that. that. That doesn't bother me so much. What bothers me is that they trust them more than the medical profession. The people that were anti-vaccination, none of this evidence has uh, ease their minds at all. I assume they're still out there doing exactly the same thing. I'd say most people who, who were, were concerned about vaccines, who smelled the smoke and want to know whether there's any fire there, um, are reassurable. Because they, they generally trust their doctors. They're not going to go to Jenny McCarthy when they're sick. They're going to go to their doctor right. when they're sick. And so they generally do trust the doctor and say most are reassurable with data. But there's a solid 15 percent who believes it's just a conspiracy to sell product and you're part of that conspiracy. And so you're not believable. So you said that um, two years ago there was a much larger outbreak of measles. Last year was 190 cases, you said. What's it look like this year? Do you have any data on that? Yeah, no, much better this year. I think what happened last year was there's nothing that educates like the virus. I mean, once people in Southern California saw measles knocking at their door, they all got vaccinated, as did okay. many people in this country. So you'd like to think that we as educators could educate uh, against this so that children wouldn't have to suffer our ignorance, but that's invariably what happens. They always do have to suffer our ignorance because nothing educates like the virus itself. And there was a big, was it in your book about there was a large community in the Northwest that was relatively well isolated where they had a 
major outbreak due to lack of vaccination. And that was actually bigger. That was in 2014. It was an Amish community that centered in uh, Medina County, Ohio, and other counties in Ohio. And that was about 680 children, mostly children. So that was three times bigger, actually, than last year's outbreak. It didn't get much play, I think, in part because it was seen as an isolated Amish community. But once it hit Southern California and Disneyland, that was seen as a shared space, as a commons. People saw, wait, thought, wait I could go to Disneyland. My parents could go, my children could go to Disneyland, whereas they didn't feel that way about uh, the children in Ohio, which is too bad because those children in Ohio did suffer and we should have cared just as much about them as we did in these, these other children in Southern California. And your most recent book, Bad Faith? The subtitle is, I'm sorry. When Religious Belief Undermines Modern Medicine. Okay, and so what is, can you synopsize that for me? Is that a word, synopsize? Yeah, so, so I, I, the, the point of view of that book is that I, I, I don't like it when, when we allow, when the, the, the country allows people to hide behind their religious beliefs to harm children, that, that they can basically um, claim religion as a legal means to sort of shield themselves from hurting their children. So, for example, a faith healer who chooses not to give their child insulin for diet diabetes or antibiotics for meningitis or life-saving chemotherapy for a cancer can say, this is my religious belief. I chose prayer instead of antibiotics for meningitis and my child died, but that was my religious belief. And for the most part, those parents are not touchable by, by the law because 44 states have religious exemptions to child abuse and neglect laws. To me, that is a direct contradiction in terms. If it's, if it's child abuse and neglect, then it's not religion. And I just think we, we shouldn't allow people to hide behind religion to do those awful things to their children. So you'll go so far as to say that a well-established and proven medical treatment such as a vaccination, if you don't get it, is actually child abuse? It's child neglect. Child neglect, yes. sorry. Um, and 44 states have exemptions for religious reasons and the parents are basically, I've, see, I've seen some prosecutions, I think, in the news, but maybe they get a two-year suspended sentence with probation or something. Yeah, that's what happens. So, so in Philadelphia, for example, there was a little boy um, named uh, Kent Scheibel who had bacterial pneumonia. The parents chose prayer instead of antibiotics. The child died. The parents were given probation. Then, two years later, they had an, another child, Brandon, a seven-month-old. They did old, the same thing. Who did the same thing. Prayer instead of antibiotics, again for bacterial pneumonia. Then they went to jail. But so basically the way it works in the United States is you get to kill one child for free. I think the more shocking thing about that statement or that case is that they didn't learn their lesson. That's really bizarre. Um, so they still thought that their prayer was just unanswered. That's right. That was their, I don't know what their excuse was. But no, the, the thing was that we, we hadn't gotten close enough to God. We hadn't prayed hard enough. So it was their fault. It was at some level, therefore, for, for not being closer to God, but it had nothing to do with not, with not giving antibiotics. Wow, that's shocking, I must say. And have, how many cases like this in your book do you have statistics on how often this happens? Well, remember, these are generally isolated and insular communities, so it's often hard to know how often it happens, but it happens commonly. The woman who I think... It must make the public health news, though, right? If a child... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're saying it could, this could, a child could die in isolation and the cause of death, it'll be listed as bacterial pneumonia, not that child had bacterial pneumonia, parents refused treatment? It won't be listed as anything. I mean, if you go, for example, to Idaho or, or Oregon before they had a better law and, and look at the grave site next to groups like the followers of, of uh, Christ Church, you'll, you'll find all these childhood graves and, and nobody did an autopsy. They were just buried. It's, wow. I didn't know that you could have a death and not have to report it. So just that's shocking. So, well, um, so sum this up real quickly. Vaccinations are safe. They're always tested. Good. They're safe. They're good. And they're, they're not absolutely safe. I mean, any, any, safe. any product that has a positive effect can have a negative effect. The vaccines are no different. But the, the benefits of vaccines clearly and definitively outweigh their risks for every child, assuming there's not a clear medical contraindication. Yes, vaccines are good. And one thing that um, I didn't read in your book, of course, but after the whole autism scare, there were some doctors that would come out and say, um, okay, vaccination's good, but you can spread it out for years instead of giving them all at once. And is there any problem with just going full force like it's always been done with a baby and giving multiple vaccinations, or is there any reason to spread it out? The, there's no reason to spread it out. There are many studies done before a vaccine is ever licensed and put onto the schedule, so-called concomitant use studies, which show you that you can give all those vaccines at the same time, that when a vaccine is added, you're not interfering with the safety or immunogenicity profile of existing vaccines or vice versa. To spread it out is simply to delay it and increase the period of time during which children would be susceptible to these diseases with no benefit. 
And one of the things that I read recently online, which was frustrating, even though I'm not a scientist or a doctor, somebody wrote that if you believe in how vaccines work, then you believe in homeopathy, because they were equating the two. Um, homeopathy, we know there's no active ingredient in it. Just tell me, how, how does a vaccine work? Yeah, so a vaccine, what you do is you, you, you weaken, there's a variety of ways you can make a vaccine. You can take part of, of the virus or bacteria. You can, you can weaken the virus or bacteria. Um, you could, could, there's a variety of ways, too. You can kill the virus or bacteria. And so what it does is it induces the immunity that's induced by natural infection without making a child pay the price of natural infection. So completely, the, it's, it has nothing to do with homeopathy. Nothing, don't, obviously. Don't get a homeopathic vaccination. Get a vaccination from your medical doctor. There's no such thing as, they're called nosos, by the way, but there's okay. no such thing as a homeopathic vaccination. Homeopathy is, is the equivalent of the placebo. So. Okay, I'm just trying to get it right out there so that uh, I, everything I can think of, just so that you can respond sure. to it. So, but I really thank you for taking the time to see me. Sure, thank you. Paul Offit, he's been a guest here on 502 Conversations. He's got several books out. Google him, they're all over Amazon. On. Um, uh, Deadly Choices, great book. I look forward to reading Blind Faith. Bad uh, Faith. Bad Faith, gosh. Blind Faith is a Joe McGinnis book. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Sure, thank you.